Okay, so adsorption is, um, is an, again one of these representative units that can be applied, the concepts can be applied elsewhere. Here's a variety of good references uh, for you. One of the better ones on here is um, the adsorption reference, second last one from Ullman's Encyclopedia, and I give you the, the DOI for it so you can go look it up. Um, Perry's, that hyperlink over there, put, takes you to straight to chapter 22, which is a good uh, comprehensive reference as well. Now, let's look at the reason why I've put this topic at this point in the course is if we look back at what we've covered so far, we've essentially covered mostly continuous operations. Sedimentation is continuous, uh, flocculation inside the sedimentation is continuous, a centrifuge and cyclone. Membranes operate mostly continuous except for very short back flushing um, that's automated. Vacuum filtration is continuous. Liquid-liquid extraction when you operate it in counter current is continuous. Really probably one of the only batch units we've looked at is the, the plate and frame press. We have to stop. Um, you get a pressure, you get a, a, a volume of filtrate built up. You have to clean it out and restart it again. And now we're going to look at adsorption and then drying after that. These are batch or, or what we say cycled operations. You run the unit, stop, you have to regenerate it or clean it out and uh, repeat. Okay, so, so it's, a, it's an intentional change in the way we're going to look at things from this point. Now, we also, my goals with this section is so that you just get a feeling of what these adsorbers look like and understand the equilibrium ideas that happen in an adsorber. Those of you that are taking 4K, uh, with Prashant are very lucky because the equations from that course are used pretty much right here as is. Also, those of you that are taking bio uh, program, um, you've seen the Michaelis-Menten equation, and that is, again, comes right out of this topic. Okay, this, well, you not cut, doesn't come out of this topic. The equation structure is identical to the ones we develop here. So let's take a, a little bit of an, a look at this adsorption. Um, comes from this general word, sorption. And there's absorption and AD, AB, sorption. Uh, let's just um, be clear what adsorption is. Adsorption is we've got a fluid phase, we've got a solute, and we want to transfer that solute to the solid phase, particles. Okay, so some terminology that we use is we've got our sorbate or adsorbate, as I'll, I'll tend to use the full word. Adsorbate is adsorbed. Um, onto the solid. Another word that's adsorbate um, is often just the solute. So if you want to just see that as the species of interest or solute, um, but I'll, I'll use the more correct term adsorbate. The adsorbent is the material that we're going to add, adsorb onto. So that's my solid species typically and um, I'm going to uh, add that to my system so it's a mass separating agent. There is a bit of energy separating agent that occurs here. You need a pressure drop to, to move yourself through this packed bed of solids. Uh, so an ESA is required, but it's not a separating agent per se. It's, it's more just a driving force to move material. Um, so it's probably not correct to see it as an ESA. Though there's another aspect to this. Once you regenerate your bed, you try to reverse the separation. And to do that, you need an energy separating agent. And so there is really an ESA during the regen step. Okay. Now, absorption is something that um, is also an absorption process. It's typically you're taking a gas into the liquid phase, something that you've covered in other courses and in uh, thermodynamics perhaps and in 3M. But adsorption is we're looking at a solid surface. That's the key distinction. So it's a, a different phase, either gas or liquid going onto a solid surface. And where this um, topic can be extended to, so we won't cover ion exchange and we won't cover chromatography, but those two units are, follow the same principle as adsorption. So the similar equations, similar geometry of the vessels, uh, similar equipment. So let's just quickly take a look at ion exchange. Ion exchange is um, a simple concept where you're taking one ion out of the solution and exchanging it with another. A classic example of that is if you want to soften water. So hard water 
as um, it's typically called, is uh, water that's rich in calcium ions. If you want to remove the calcium ions from the water and exchange them with sodium ions, you can contact it with an ion exchange solid, typically in a pellet form, and the sodium ions on the resin, on the ions, on the solid phase resin will be exchanged and it takes the calcium out of the water. Okay, so it's uh, a, a sodium-based water, uh, so, sorry, a water with sodium ions is a, is a softer water and often more palatable and has applications as well in the process industries where calcium ions will precipitate out and cause scaling and fouling for you. Um, sodium ions will have less of a problem. Okay, chromatography, similar idea um, where you're removing a solute out of the liquid phase onto a column onto the solid phase. And then once you've removed it, you want to recover that solute later on. Um, so chromatography plays on that same idea. We're going to see this batch of material moving through a, a bed, and then we're going to stop the process and recover the solute from the bed afterwards. Okay, so before I um, go on with some examples, let me, uh, I'm going to just pause here and let you uh, answer these three questions. So take out your phone, take out your tablet, computer, whatever device, um, maybe look up some information and uh, roughly split the class into three. So this side over here can answer this uh, question, the middle section and then the edge over here. So. Okay, so people over here on this side can answer the question, what adsorbents are typically used or are existing out there for various applications? The middle uh, part of the class, however you want to divide yourself, um, is... Just give me some application examples. of adsorption and the people all over here on the edge is okay so I will say there's a lot more out there than just Wikipedia article on this topic uh, try to find some other references change your Google search up a little bit and see what interesting topics you can find. So I'll give you a few minutes to do that and then we'll get some brainstorming and some ideas coming back. Is it still absorption when the solid and the gas phase or whatever phase react when they meet or is that something else? Um, you can have it so that they react and then they can, uh, they can also be involved in the separation afterwards. So the adsorption process is just the connection. Right. Yeah, so we'll see that distinction being made coming up, yeah. As long as new species are not being created, it's sort of like a chemical bonding to the surface. Yeah. Okay, and discuss what you found with someone next to you as well. We'll get some groups to give ideas.
Okay, so I'll give you another minute or so. Okay, people here on this side, which absorbents did you guys find? <coughs> Sorry? Silica gel? Okay. So silica gel. Uh, you, here's some silica gel here that you can pass around. You may have seen this before. It's often used as cat litter um, because it adsorbs the smell and the, uh, obviously the liquid part of it. Uh, you've also seen it if you've bought a computer or some electronic device. You'll find a little white bag of pellets, plastic-looking pellets in there. If you've opened the bag, it's actually the silica gel. Okay, other examples? Graphene. Graphi Graphene. Graphene. Yeah, aluminum. aluminum. Mole molecular sieves. Molecular sieves. Okay, that's an interesting uh, one. So aluminum-based Okay, so often just shortened to mole sieves or molecular sieves. Um, the other word for that is uh, zeolites that you might find. Anything else? Other adsorbents? Okay. Um, application examples. There's no one here in the middle. It seems very empty. Dylan. Hard water softening, is that similar to ion exchange? Or? Okay, so that it might just be an article that's on, on both the topics mixed up. Okay, yeah. Gas masks, filter canisters to remove, the, the article didn't say. Okay, so carbon in the canister will absorb a certain species selectively out of the gas. Yeah. Adsorption chillers, yeah, that's an interesting uh, application of thermodynamics there. If, um, a, a, a refrigerant, a, re, a refrigerant that has no moving parts. So if you're interested in that topic, it's, uh, it's not a separation step, but adsorption chillers are really interesting from a thermodynamic perspective. Other applications, yeah. Uh, clarification, of sugar. clarification of sugar. So what did the article mention what was being removed? Color impurities are adsorbed onto the surface of the adsorbent. Um, another application that's similar to that is the water um, water filters that you like. The, so the Brita water filters here. I've cut one open, and you can see the carbon, um, the black carbon that's inside there. So pass that one around. Um, that's an adsorbing. Um, certain ions in the water that are objectionable um, from a taste perspective. Other applications? Yeah, Sean, sorry. Um, I know someone mentioned silica gel and you talked about computer parts. I know there's also like the packets of like vitamins because it absorbs like water. Right. So, yeah, th so there's a little bag of silica gel, right? So do not eat. It's a desiccant. Desiccant is it's removing water or moisture from tablets, from electronic products while they're being shipped. Um, that moisture. Um, will adsorb onto the surface and not onto the parts being shipped. Okay. So another one? Uh, like soaps and detergents. Soaps and detergents. Zeolites, molecular sieves, you may not realize this, but you, the washing powder, if you st still have a powder-based washing machine, they'll often blend in zeolites into that washing powder to adsorb the calcium from the water so that you get a, a better soap action on the clothes. So zeolites are really interesting. Zeolites are naturally occurring minerals. It takes about 50,000 years to create them naturally in the Earth's crust. Um, but it, uh, they occur in such vast quantities. And we can also make them synthetically very cheaply. But they're added to washing powders uh, for, that, for that reason. Other applications? OK. The people over here on this side, any? Any ideas or concepts on how adsorbents work? 
a little bit of a tougher one. Okay, so the particles migrate to the surface and are held there by intermolecular bonds or forces. So the adsorbent, one of the characteristics of an adsorbent is a very high surface area. So you've got your impurity somewhere out here. It will migrate into the particle and stay attached to that surface due to intermolecular forces. Okay, so one of those adsorbents, uh, one of the, the highest surface area adsorbents, a small teaspoon of that adsorbent has the equivalent surface area of one quarter of a hockey field. Okay? So a very, very large surface area. It's um, on one of the slides further on. Here we go. Um, so typical values of adsorbents per gram, 1,200 meters squared per gram. Okay? If you consider a hockey field about 5,000 meters squared, a very, very small quantity of that adsorbent has a very, very large surface area um, because internally it's got this very high um, porosity, so particles migrate into there and adsorb onto the surface. Okay. So there's a number of examples in the, in the course notes. I'll just go through one that's a little bit further down here because it ties up nicely actually with the topic we've just looked at on um, stage-based operations. So here's, here's, an, here's an application for very few parts of the world use this flow sheet anymore. Um, you'll see why in a minute. But one way that we can extract gold out of the ground is we crush that rock to very, very small particle sizes to expose the gold. Right? So we saw that there in the midterm. And uh, speaking of the midterms, I finished grading them last night. The only reason why I don't have them with me today is I need to enter the, day, the grades into Avenue the TAs and myself are going to do that today. So um, I will return them on Friday. So they are done, just, uh, just got to do some data entry. So in the midterm, you saw that idea of using cyclones to ensure that the particle size is small. Well, why do we want small particle sizes, right? The smaller you make your particle size, so here's your, your piece of ore out of the ground, and there's tiny pieces of gold exposed. Okay, but that piece of gold that's exposed on the surface, if you could do a cross-section inside the particle, probably goes a little bit deeper. Okay, so if you can crush this particle to a smaller size, you expose more surface area of the, of the ore, and you have a greater amount of gold available for um, leaching. So here's the leaching step that we just learned about. We didn't look at the topic, but we're going to see this applied. One way to get gold out of the solid phase is to put it in a solution of sodium cyanide, which now you see why this isn't used very much, because you have to ensure that the pH is kept very high to ensure that cyanide stays in solution and doesn't uh, go out and kill people around you. Okay? It's also another reason why you probably shouldn't dip your gold jewelry into cyanide solutions, but that's another idea that you're probably not going to try. So there's an important equation there. Gold is in equilibrium in this equation. So we've got gold in the solid phase. We want to get gold into the liquid phase, what's called the orocyanide complex. So that's a liquid phase. And one way we can do that is if we can drive this reaction forward, we can do that by taking that ion out of solution. Okay. So if you take that ion out of solution, you drive this equilibrium forward to, so more of it can cre be created, but if, then you take it out of solution, then it keeps driving the reaction forward. One way we can do that is by loading up that ion onto activated carbon. So if you put not only cyanide in solution with your gold ore particles, but you also contact it with activated carbon, that black stuff that you're passing around here, that's activated carbon coconut shells that have just been charred, you can adsorb that orocyanide complex onto the surface of the carbon and drive the reaction forward. And we do that in a CSTR. And once you've got gold onto that surface, you can separate it from the liquid phase using a cyclone or a screen or a sedimentation. 
any one of those options work to separate out the, what we now call the gold that's loaded onto the carbon. So you've created a new separation problem for yourself. You've got gold in liquid form on carbon. You need to get it off, uh, get that out of your liquid phase. Then what we can go do is take that carbon, we can go desorb the orocyanide ion off it in caustic solution and regenerate that carbon and reuse it. Okay? And we do that in, in a CSTR. There's one stage, one leaching step, where there's your water, your cyanide, your gold, and your bubbling oxygen into it. So all your species going in there, solids, liquids, gases, all bubbling in and being well mixed in a CSTR. But one stage is not enough. So what we can do is, uh, this is the last time I went to South Africa. This is on the highway, just off the side of the highway. It's a nice thing about living in a warm country is their chemical plants are all outdoors. So we can actually see what's going on inside there. And there's just a series of CSTRs. So one, two, three, four, five, six, maybe seven stages. And then behind it is another stage running. So in parallel, uh, two, two sets of them going in parallel. And what we're doing is we're taking our carbon and sending it counter current to our pulp. Pulp is just essentially your leaching um, ore with the water phase and the cyanide going counter current to the activated carbon. So there's leaching. The same set of equations that we looked at earlier, mass balances, volume balances, except in this particular circuit, you would have also your mass transfer equations that tell how fast the gold loads onto the cyanide complex. And you would have your equilibrium equation. We're going to look at that in the next class, the equilibrium equation that tells what's the equilibrium of gold in solution versus gold on the surface of the activated carbon. Okay, so these sorts of things can be modeled using the same ideas we've, we've just learned about. Okay. And then once you get your carbon off at the top here, you'll see this word to elution. Elution is just a term that's used there to remove the gold off the carbon. The carbon then is recycled and sent back to the beginning again. The other direction, we've got our ore going here. Every single stage going down, you've got less and less gold remaining in there. So gold, if you're not familiar with gold, out of the Earth's surface, we, out of the Earth's uh, surface, we get out about eight grams of gold per ton of ore. So just think about that ratio. Eight grams of gold per ton. If you do the numbers, that's in the parts per million range. So it comes in at that level of concentration, and we have it leaving at about 0.5 grams of gold per ton of ore. Okay, so every stage removes more and more of it. Okay, so there's a, there's a great example of, pretty, uh, of a lot of the units we've learned about. Sedimentation, cyclones are used to recover the carbon. Um, we've learned about leaching in, in, a, in a sideways type manner. And we're going to learn here in the next class about how the concentration of gold is in equilibrium with the concentration of gold on the carbon. Okay, so a great example of, of combining all of those. So just a, a few more minutes remain here. I'll just show you um, some other applications, and then we'll look at the adsorbents in the next class. So some other applications we've seen, um, seen and heard some of these over here. The final ones are on gas purification. We'll often use this to remove carbon dioxide from natural gas. So, so natural gas that we use for a fuel source um, we want to remove the CO2 from it, or we want to remove water vapor or sulfur compounds. All of those we can adsorb out of the gas. Oxygen can be separated from nitrogen. This is really interesting. Two molecules that are very similar in size. Um, one of them, nitrogen, gets adsorbed more strongly onto a zeolite. And I'll show you why in the next class. Um, we can remove water vapor from ethanol vapor, acetone from an air vent. So if you're venting an air stream out to the atmosphere, we should adsorb all our impurities, and one of them often is acetone. Yeah. Can't you do a gas-gas separation by pressure swing adsorption? Is that a thing? 
Yeah, pressure swing adsorption, we'll, we'll cover that topic later on. Yeah, so gas, gas adsorption. And then liquid, liquid separation. So um, here's two species, two isomers, very the same molecular weight, but just a slightly different shape um, in that molecule. That's a very, very tough separation to do with distillation, right? These two species have the same or similar boiling points. Um, they have the same physical shape, so you, you um, which is a really, really difficult separation to do. Pretty much the only other way you can do it is if you want to use, find an adsorbent which will preferentially take up the P or the M isomer. Um, so, so adsorption plays a role in some of these very difficult separations. So there's a few others on there, and you can obviously research others online. So what we'll start with next class is looking at the geometry of these adsorbents as well as some properties of the adsorbents.